Hey there, what's going on? This is your boy, the Chicano Knox, coming live and direct from the Reform Underground Studios. And you know how we do on here. Uh, I'm just jumping on real quick just to, you know, just provide one of the greatest resources that has um, impacted me recently. And that's one of the books here, um, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church uh, by Mark Dever. Uh, Nine Marks Ministries, this is a, invaluable resources. But before I get into that, I want to introduce myself. This is the Chicano Knox. I'm the host of Bible Theory Podcast. Podcast And Bible Theory um, is new on YouTube. I feel like it's like 10 years too late, but I wanted to go ahead and jump on here. And if you haven't, please go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the little bell. Uh, share this. Um, comment below. And let me know, um, you know, you know, just go ahead and comment below and let me know that you're here, man. I appreciate those, everybody who's coming in. Thank you so much. Um, follow me on Twitter at the Chicano Knox and on Facebook as well. Um, every Thursday, um, pretty much I'm on the Laborers podcast. It's kind of like a network of podcasters. We get together and we talk about like pretty much every anything that's on the docket. Um but I wanted to go ahead and share, you know, just a bunch of random stuff, basically, about Bible Theory podcast. Um, for those who don't know, Bible Theory is a podcast about the church for the church. It's about ecclesiology, the study about the doctrine of the church. And it's not just a bunch of like doctrine, um, ivory tower, seminarian type talk. Don't get me wrong. I love talking seminary. I love, you know, libraries and talking like ivory type stuff. But I want to take it down to the streets. I want to take that ivory type stuff, that theology, and take it to the streets because that's where it's at. That's where the people need us, need us the most. They need the church. You know what I mean? And that's what my podcast is all about. And if you like jersey wearing uh, type stuff, then you're going to enjoy Bible theory. And that's one of my heart passions. My heart cry is, uh, you know, the lost evangelism, uh, reaching them and teaching them about the doctrine of the church. Who is the church? What is the nature of the church? What do we do in the church? How do we worship in the church? Who do we worship in the church? What is the church's primary objective and mission on earth? Um, you know what I mean? Um, who do we worship? How do we worship in the church? Right? The ecclesia. Uh, you know, who is the church? Um, who is not the church? Right? False teachings in the church. That and more. Okay. So we we go through it all. You know what I mean? And I want to thank you so much for all your support, all the love that I've been getting thus far. In you know, this past year, year and a half of recording podcasts, I've been learning and growing and still learning and growing. Uh, so one, uh, so one, thank you so much for your patience. Two, thank you for all your love and support. And three, I need more love and support. <laughs> so uh, go ahead and take out your phone and like and rate Bible theory on your podcast applications. Give it a five star rating on iTunes, um, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Google Podcasts. Go ahead and give it a five star rating. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, Nine Marks is an awesome ministry. Mark Dever. So, if you guys don't know this book, Nine Marks of a Healthy Church by Mark Dever, it's a great book. It's a great book, man. It's not that big of a book. It's like like 240 pages long. Not that big of a book. Not that expensive. Very inexpensive. Uh, let me ask you the question. Let me ask you a question. Do you, do you, um, let me ask you a question. Hold on. I just left my mind. <laughs> do you know how hard it is to find it is for a person to find a church in the modern day? Answer, go ahead and comment below. Let me know what are your thoughts about this? How hard for a person or a family 
to go out there in the wild and find a church? Is it easy? Is it hard? Is it difficult? Is it impossible? Go ahead and let me let me know below. Let me know some of your thoughts. How easy or how difficult it is for a family to go out there and just start looking for a church. Let me know below. And this is what this book is not about, by the way. It's not about how to find a church. It's about marks, markers of how of of how to identify a healthy church a vibrant church, a biblical church. Uh, a church. Um, it, it, it's, not, not, it's not like it's going to like lead you to your perfect church because that's not what this book does. It's not going to lead you to a perfect church because, number one, there's no such thing as a perfect church. That's a myth. And, um, and, and it's not going to take you out of a perfect church because that's not what this book is designed to, designed to do is to take you out of a perfect church because there's no such thing as a perfect church. And if you think there's a perfect church out there, I would like to ask, challenge you, um, you know, to go back to the Gospels and reread, please, because um, there's no such thing. And if you think you're in a perfect church, you need to, uh, you know, get involved more and you'll see how imperfect it is. So this is a case. He's making a case on what are the indicators? What are the markers? What are the trip wires that would make it obvious for a person or for a family to go out there and find a healthy church? How would you know if you are in a healthy church? How would you know that you're stepping into a healthy church? Good question. Well, he breaks it up for you and he gives you nine marks, nine markers, nine indicators. Uh, it's basically, in my point of view, it's a highlighter book. Get a highlighter. You're going to need it. All right. And it's, you know. Can you guess how many chapters there are in this book? Nine. <laughs> All right. So let's go through the chapters real quick. I wanted to go ahead and just review this real quick. Um, mark one, chapter one, basically. Do you know the first marker of a healthy church is? Do you know what it is? If you know what it is because you read the book, comment below. Let me know. What is the first marker that you should immediately get, you know, come across that you should encounter right away. Some people might say, dude, it better be the coffee. If they don't have good coffee, I ain't going back. Some people might say, if they don't have a nice worship leader, I ain't going back. Some people might say, you know, if they don't have, if they have pews and not cushion seats, then I'm not going in. Um, I would say, you know, those are very trivial matters. Those are very trivial, minuscule manners. Um, things that are tiny. Those are what um, Scott Aniel in my interview told me that those are creature comforts. That we should not select a church based on creature comforts. You know, going into a church, judging the church because of its music, judging the church because of its of the of the seating the arrangements of the seats, the pictures on the wall. Those are the type of things, you know, coffee is bad, donuts are over or, or like past due. Those are the type of things that are called creature comforts and that we should stay away from that. Um, the first marker of a healthy church here, which is the first chapter, is ex expository preaching, breaking down a text, keeping your finger in the text, Staying on topic, staying true to the Bible, and letting the Bible speak for itself. We are not, like we are, the preacher has a very important job, and that is to point to Christ. Point to Christ. That's, how, that's your one job, bro. You only have one job <laughs> on earth is to point to Christ. And if, and if a preacher cannot rightly divide the, the word, rightly handle the word, rightly point to Christ, keep it the main thing, the main thing, 
uh, and not get on his hobby horse, not go up there and talk about politics and not go up there and start making, uh, you know, stealing the glory from the Lord. Expository preaching. Take a paragraph. Work the next paragraph. Continue the, the whole book of the book of Luke, the book of Romans, whatever it is, right? It's very rare to find churches that are dedicated to preaching the word of God. There's Calvary Chapel out there that, you know, the first church that I encountered with in my walk with Christ. When I first came to Christ, it was an Armenian church because Calvary chapels are um, premillennialist and Armenian, by the way, and there's soteriology that, but yet they make a high priority of preaching the word of God verse by verse, expository preaching. Although they're inconsistent on other things and they take traditions up on other issues in theology, like in soteriology and eschatology, but the one thing they do emphasize at Calvary chapels, I give them credit, is that they do expound the word verse by verse in the best way they could, in the best way they can. And they're doing it now. It's a tradition that Chuck Smith has you know, brought into that movement is that they are verse by verse, which is, I do give them credit for that. You know what I mean? Because not many churches are verse by verse. You, you step into an assemblies of God, chances are it's not verse by verse. It's topical. Chances are the pastor is preaching his hobby horse. You know what I mean? Or going through a series. And I'm not saying, you know, don't preach topical. I'm not saying... It's, it's a sin for a pastor to like, you know, to go through a series. You know what I mean? It's okay for a pastor to take a break from going through a book. Like, for example, if I was teaching on the book of Romans, and then all of a sudden I say, we're going to take a break from the book of Romans. We'll stop in chapter five, and then we'll switch our minds and go to um, an Easter sermon. Because today's Easter, for example. Or tomorrow's Christmas service, for example, or or something very something very evil happened in our community. We need to address it biblically. So, and then after that, you go back to Book of Romans and you continue. You pick up where you left off. There's nothing wrong with doing that. The second chapter um, that makes a case for a healthy church, Pastor Mark talks about biblical theology. That's the second thing that you need to look for in the church. Because when you're going out there and looking for a church, you're just like, what do I look for? How do I know? Read this book. Read this book. Sorry. Chapter two, biblical theology. The church needs to have a biblical theology because every church has a biblical theology. Even those churches that says, we don't need theology. All we need is the Bible. Have you ever heard those churches? Man, those churches are lame. Because the Bible is filled with theology. It's the study of God. When you read the Bible, you're reading theology. You just don't know it. Um, biblical theology uh, is basically a theology about the books of the Bible, about the history of those books, about the authors of those books, about the factual um, events of those books. Um, it gives you... Um, you know what I mean? An understanding of the literature in the books. It gives you an understanding of who wrote the books, the historical context, the background of the books. Uh, it gives you the big picture, the small picture, the broader sense of the, of the, of the scripture text. You know what I mean? So biblical theology is a wide genre um, of theology, right? Of systematic theology. But biblical theology is where the pastor is most influential in in his congregation uh, because you know although people are going to get influenced by other theologians like Spurgeon, Calvin, or whoever fill in the blank, but you know that Christian sitting in in his pew, he's going to get mostly influenced by his elder, by his pastor the most. He should be because that's the pastor's job is to influence and disciple, make disciples, right? And those people listening, um, you know, to him and under his authority, 
Uh, and those church members are under his influence, you know what I mean, and under his teaching, under his authority. So they're, they're supposed to be most influenced by his past, by their pastor. And that pastor has, you know, this is where the pastor gets his, his power from, his, his, his ammo. Yes, he goes to the commentaries and the dictionaries, and he, he might have traditions like Presbyterian or Baptist, but the pastor is going to be a yo. Biblical theology is where I get my, you know, my ammo, where I get my, my philosophy and theological vision and mission for this church, right? Chapter three, the gospel. The gospel is going to be a marker of a healthy church. If your church is not preaching the gospel, not teaching it, not believing it, not creating that gospel culture, making the gospel the main thing, the main thing. And by the way, saying the gospel is not the gospel. Just because the pastor is up there saying, we need to go out there and preach the gospel, that doesn't mean he actually preached the gospel. All he did was, he, all he did was say the word gospel, and then all of a sudden everybody is saying, today's gospel message was really awesome, wasn't it? And he was like, well, actually he didn't preach the gospel. He just said the word gospel. You know what I mean? So a lot of pastors do that, by the way. So teaching the gospels, which is obviously the gospel record, Mark, I mean, uh, yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel record, the gospel account, and then the gospel is about what? The life, the death, the burial, the ascension, and the resurrection of Jesus, and the return of Jesus, the ruling lordship of Jesus. Um, the gospel is the good news, right? The gospel is also about the bad news, right? About the law, how Jesus fulfilled the law, right? Um, and those who are not under Christ are still under the law and therefore condemned by the law because they can't keep the law and they can never keep the law. So therefore, they're still condemned by the law, even though they don't believe in God or whatever. You know what I mean? That's the gospel. The, God, the, the, the preacher needs to preach this, this gospel message. Um, number four, a biblical understanding of conversion. Regeneration, faith. How do people come to faith? How do how are people converted? By the way, is it through a prayer and altar call? Is it um, repeat after me? Is it is it at a revival? How do people? What is the biblical understanding of conversion? By the way, is it my power? Is it my will be done? Is it um, self regeneration? You know, is it double imputation? or single imputation. Those are giant things, by the way, and many people on the streets right now listening are probably like, what in the world is that? Well, read this book, read this book. I don't have time to give you all the definitions. I really don't. I need to move on. Um, chapter five, a biblical understanding of evangelism. Some, some churches are just not balanced, man, with their mission, with their mission and theological vision for their church. Some churches are like, all we do is evangelism, is send people out in the streets. We're, we're so outward minded that we're, no, we're, we're not inward you know, focused at all. We got divorce rates. We got the, the children's ministry is kind of really secular. We got the youth group you know, doing drugs and they're off the hook and they're going wild. But man, we're good about reaching the lost. You know, the front door is as big as the back door. You, you, do you get what my, my drift is? Some churches are just imbalanced. And they have an unbiblical approach to evangelism because they have an unbiblical understanding of conversion, right? Of soteriology, of the sovereignty of God, of the process of salvation, uh, possibly even the history of the church. Uh, let me see, uh, chapter six, the biblical understanding of church membership. Mark Deveron points out that when you step into a church and they say, we're all just kumbaya here, there's no accountability, accountability. we don't even know who's who in the zoo, that's a, that's a red flag. You should take three steps back and say, nice to meet you, thank you so much, we'll, we'll let you know. Don't call me, I'll call you, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because a church that doesn't offer accountability, a church that doesn't offer membership, a church doesn't a church that doesn't offer any type of visibility for you and your family, 
it should be a really big red flag. Um, chapter seven, biblical discipline. If a church is not practicing discipline and they just allow anything to happen, one is because they're probably um, compromising with the culture. They're practicing a, a culture of tolerance, which is very popular in many businesses right now. And, and HR departments are so sensitive right now where, you know, I'm going to complain because you said something bigoted or I'm going to complain because you didn't call me he, she pronouns or, you know what I mean? And then you, you get disciplined because you're not using my pronouns at work. You know what I mean? We're, we're in that kind of culture. The church right now is actually trying to implement that in their hiring process. The church is saying we're equal employment here. It's like, well, technically the church is not a worldly institution. We understand what you're trying to do there, but the church is not an equal employer in the sense of employers and employer because the church is not an employment. The church is not an employment. I don't care what kind of ministry you are. A church should practice church discipline. And there's a point for discipline. There's a reason for it. And there's a goal in mind when it comes to discipline. It's not just get out of here. It's not just don't talk. It's not just we're protecting our flock here. So you're excommunicado. No. You know, yes, the shepherds need to protect their flock, guard the sheep, feed the sheep, protect the word, meaning keep pure the doctrine of God, the doctrine of the Trinity. If someone is going around your church causing divisions, like for sure, legit divisions and telling people that the Trinity is false, the pastor has the authority by God to go up to that person to correct them in love and restore that brother to the church. If he doesn't listen, then you need to take two or more brothers. Tell it to the church, Jesus says, Matthew 18. If that doesn't work, then you need to hand them over to the world and say, go, get out of here. We, don't, we already told you to repent. We told you in love many times. We had counseling, counseling sessions with you. We, we tried to explain these things in, from different vantage points, and you still refuse. So now it's time to really cut you off. You cannot take the Lord's table. You cannot have your kids baptized or you cannot be baptized yourself because of this. You won't repent of this. So yes, we need to discipline you either in a formal or informal public or private manner in a private way. Depends on the situation. And if it, there's many churches that are not doing this because they're uh, practicing a, a, a culture of tolerance and they're practicing or they're practicing a, a form of anti, antinomianism they have a weird view of the law of God in Old Testament and saying that we don't need to practice the law. We don't need to preach from the Old Testament. The, you know, a lot of wacky type views out there saying that, you know, the law of God is, is null and void. And we don't need to preach it or teach it or meditate on it. We don't need to preach the Old Testament. All we need is Jesus. And it's like, there's a lot there that sounds pretty nice to the ears, but in practice, it, 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 it spells ruin. It spells ruin. It spells scandals in the church. Um, hello. Hello. Chapter 8. Um, a concern for discipleship and growth. Yo, if you're not growing as a church, there's something wrong. There's something wrong. And I'm not talking about like numbers. Like, oh, we got new members. Yes, that's a concern too. But that's not what this chapter is about. Um. And chapter nine, a biblical church leadership, elders, deacons, is it women elders? Is it women pastors? How about he, she pronouns type pastors? Hmm. How about, is it okay to be a gay on the inside and kind of be a pastor at the same time? Even, is it okay to be gay and a, and a Christian at the same time? Well, that's where we're at. That's where we're at. Many churches are struggling with this. Yo, it doesn't matter what, what traditions you're holding up. It doesn't matter what denomination you're from or non-denomination. Um, every church in the city of God is dealing with the tidal waves of secularism, the tidal waves of progressivism, the tidal waves of polarization in this country politically. 
the tidal wave of BL, BLM, um, Antifa, CRT, LGBTQ+, plus whatever. Every church is dealing with that on one level or another. And if you are not dealing with that, it's coming to you to a church near you. So anyways, I want to recommend this book, Mark Dever, um, by Nine March Ministries, um, a really awesome resource. If you are in a position of looking for a new church, if you're looking for a new church, what you need to do is some of these things, because I was in this boat. Number one, you need to pray. You need to pray constantly. You need to pray specifically. You need to pray um, specifically. What I mean is you need to pray for, Lord, is this church the church for my family? Is this church for us? Well, how do you know? Well, nine marks of a healthy church. Are they preaching the word expositely? Right? If they didn't, that week, maybe you need to go back another week and find out. Maybe you just need to go up to the pastor after church and be like, hey, um, you know, I'm new to this church, by the way, and I'm new to this area, and I would like to ask you a few questions, maybe at your office. I know today's Sunday, but maybe can I come back on a Wednesday? Can I have like 30, 40 minutes with you next Wednesday? Yes. Oh, awesome. Great. Can I bring my wife and kids? Yes. Awesome. Great. If they say, uh, I'm kind of busy. Can you talk to my secretary? I say that's a red flag. A pastor should have an availability. He should be licking his chops. Boom, boom, boom. Man, these people want to talk about the church with me. I'm going to try to squeeze you in my schedule. I, sh I, I should do everything in my power to try, right? If you're looking for a new church, um, don't give up hope. There's always a biblical church around. Here's a co common um, a thing that I run into. The only church around me, Brother Chicano, like, dude, it's like 100 miles away. It's far. Well, you know what? I would say go to that church at least once a month. Make it a priority. You put some gasoline in your car, wake up extra early, drive those four, one hour, whatever, and get yourself some Bible in you. Get yourself some fellowship in you. Get yourself some Lord's table in you. And talk to that church and be like, is there any way you guys have an awesome, solid recommendation of a church near me? Talk to that church and be like, I drove an hour, bro. Like, I'm so desperate. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm going to try to make it once a month. Is there any way you guys could, uh, you know, work with me to become a member here where me and my family could make it twice a week? You guys could chip in for gas? You never know. You know what I mean? The worst thing they could say is no. Then, you know what I mean? So that's one of the common objections I get sometimes. It's like, I, I don't go to church because it's like so far away. Well, I, I, I used to know a family that used to drive four hours to church, to my old church. Four hours. Four hours. They did it faithfully for like three or four years. You know what I mean? It can, it can be done. Another objection is there's no biblical churches around me. You're like, are you sure about that? Are you being nitpicky? The problem is sometimes we are just way too nitpicky. We like to nitpick and be like, well, you know, they're, they're like Baptists. Okay, bro, let me tell you something about this. I'm a Presbyterian, 1646er, bro. But let me tell you about this. If there's nothing but Baptist, Reformed Baptist churches around me that are meeting pretty much more or less the, the the nine marks standard minimum and there's not one presbyterian church around me guess where i'm going the closest reformed baptist church that meets the nine marks minimum that's where i'm going that's where i'm taking my family and if there's no presbyterian churches around me guess what church i'm going to become a part of as a member the baptist church that's preaching faithfully, that's meeting the nine marks minimum, even though they're Baptist, even though they're London Baptist or whatever, and, and they're not baptizing babies and they're not Presbyterian to the bone. Yeah, that's a bummer. But guess what? I need the church. 
I need the church, man. I need the church. I need to go to church. That's what, that's God's will for us. We can't just skip church and be like, I'm not going to about this church. I'm Presbyterian, man. I don't know. There's no good churches around me. You're like, that's not a good excuse, bro. You need to get your butt into church. Get your kids into church. Yeah, they're not baptizing babies. They're not 1646ers. But guess what? If that's the only water you're going to get in a dry and weary land, you better drink that water, bro. That's the answer for that. Same thing for the, if you want to reverse the roles. I'm a, I'm a Baptist, and all I see is Presbyterian churches around me, man. All they do is baptize babies and read the West West. I can't go there. There's no biblical churches around me. Well, guess what? It's God's will for you to be part of a congregation, be held accountable. You need to stop being nitpicky and get your butt in there. Pick one of those biblical Presbyterians and join them. Until there's a Baptist congregation near you, then you could leave there peacefully, biblically, and then go there. Until then, you need to get your butt into that church. Now, if you have options to say Presbyterian or Baptist and you feel convicted to go to a Baptist route and their biblical meeting nine marks minimum, then yeah, go there because there's options. Oh, what about um, John MacArthur type churches? Do your best and get your butt in the church, okay? Okay. That's what, that's where we're at. Well, what if there's a bunch of woke CRT, BLM, Antifa type churches. Start a church. Contact the Presbyterian whatever and contact the Baptist whatever and tell them your dilemma and prove it with hardcore data and say, we need one of your pastors to come out here and start a church. I have a family of not just me, but I have like a five family, me and five other families that are coming together. Come down here. Call a pastor down here. We'll call him. You know what I mean? We'll, we'll, we'll chip in. Do something. Do something. Do something. Don't just sit there and cry and become cry about the problem. You know what I mean? Be a be a be, uh, a solution maker. Look for the solution biblically. I encourage you to read Nine Marks. It's a great it's a great book. It was uh, written a while back. Um. And I, I recommend everybody should give it a read, especially if you're out there looking for a church. Because it's not easy looking for a church in the dry and weary land where everybody is woke, uh, CRT, Antifa, LGBTQ, WWE type stuff. You want to be careful. You know what I mean? You can't just go into a church and check off the boxes anymore. You do have to do an investigation. You do have to put in skin in the game. Unfortunately, that requires time. Like the church is not going to come out and say, yay, we're woke. We're woke over here. They're not going to come out and do that. Now, 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 some churches might do that. And that might be like, honey, get the kids. Let's get out of here. Do it. Get out of those work, woke churches. But a church that is really woke, they're not going to tell you for the most part that they're really woke. They're not going to tell you that they voted for abortion. They're, they're not going to tell you that uh, they believe in all kinds of weird conspiracies, like about, about Russia, um, you know, about all kinds of weird things, okay? They're not going to do that. The pastor is not going to come out and tell you that it's okay to be gay. It's okay for women pastors. He's not going to do that. Some churches might, but you need to investigate those things. You need to have a relationship with those elders and deacons to ask them those kind of pinpoint questions. That's the only way you're going to find out if your church is really woke. And some pastor, I had this one pastor to say, man, I don't like that word, man. I don't like when people throw that word around, man. What do you mean by woke? And I gave them like hardcore definitions from like woke books, you know. And he's like, well, I don't know anybody, any of my pastor friends that believes that. And it's like, well, yeah, because they don't tell you the truth. They don't tell you. They're not going to come out and tell you, bro, that they, you know, that te technically they endorse abortion. <laughs> you know what I mean? Technically, they endorse, they support Antifa and BLM riots. They're not going to tell you that, bro. 
they're wolves in sheep clothing. That's what they are. But they're not going to tell you that they're wolves. Okay. So you got to have a relationship. You got to have. Be, you got to be bold enough. You got to have the cajones to go up there and tell them, "Hey, man, did you support abortion? What's your view on, on abortion? Straight up, yeah or nay?" Ah, uh, well, you know. All right, cool. That dude's poor abortion. <laughs> That's what you need to do. Um, you know what I mean? So some pastors are just dumb. I'm sorry. Some pastors, they're smart in one way, but they're dumb in many, many ways. So we're, we're there because there, there's a there there. So, uh, you know what I mean? Read the book, Nine Marks. Let me know what you think about it. Go ahead and like and comment below. I appreciate all your support. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Hit the like and smash that like and hit that bell thing. Appreciate it, man. God bless. Peace and love. All my Theo bros, my theologians, residential gospel gangsters holding it down for the kingdom of God. God bless you. Love you.